Um, can everybody hear me, those who are on Zoom? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so today we are going to continue with our uh, discussion. What I would like to do is to remind you where to find information. And um, again here, this is our, yes, this is our homepage. And um, as you can see, I have already uploaded the uh, video from Monday's lecture. And today, we are talking about uh, coordinate systems. So, um, what I will do is that I will get on Zoom also from my iPad because I would like to show you some things that I can write there because last time you could not see it. So, um, I will do that now. Get here and then go there and all right so we're going to this one and i will capture the screen from here okay so uh i have to do zoom first we got that part zoom i'm here Yes, start, open. Okay, so all right, I will try for a moment to show you, to capture the screen. Okay. Why is that? I start. No, it's going, it happened. So that is, okay. So everybody can see that? All right, now that's good because I can also write whenever I have to, that's perfect. Slowly but steadily we find how to do things. All right, so today we start with the coordinate system. So for those of you who are on Zoom, if you would like to ask a question, please speak up. All right, that's the best way to do it. It's just to talk and so I can hear your voice. The um, coordinate systems are not very new. I mean, if you go, depends where you go to find information, they will tell you that it's, they started about three, 400 years ago. That is not true. Coordinate systems where people were thinking about coordinate systems since almost about 2,500 years. And why is that? Because they were so um, obsessed at the standing space. I mean, the stars that you could see, they could see them moving at night. So they knew that there was something out there and because there, were, there was motion and they wanted to understand what was going on, they needed a way to be able to connect all of these independent bodies or masses they could see, and then um, be able to measure their distance, their relative position and so forth, which means that they needed to have one point of reference. Then, this is a picture it was found from um, from somebody who lived about 300 BC. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, whatever. People had a lot of, they knew a lot of things. There was not so much known. 
But um, the big circle is the sun, the smaller one is Earth, and this offside is the moon. So they were trying to figure out, even since then, people thought that Earth was like a round ball. In fact, um, Aristotle was able to prove that Earth was round from the eclipse of the moon, which is extremely interesting. And so even later, people thought it was flat. <laughs> there was a long time when they thought it was flat. It was like going like a boat on water, air, I don't know. I mean, there were some, some crazy theories. But in any case, since then, people knew that it was like that. And they wanted it's to It's 3 o'clock. OK, that's my, don't worry. They wanted to develop a common point of reference so they could project their positions and their movements. However, it was much later when Descartes developed what we call the Cartesian coordinate system. And we call it Cartesian because the Latin name for Descartes was Cartesius, all right? So the Cartesian coordinate system um, eventually led us, as we now have shapes of different types, some shapes are easier to be described in the XYZ system. Some other shapes are easy to be described in what we call the cylindrical or the spherical, all right? We have, in fact, the, the fundamental um, shapes is like a cube, um, it's a cylinder, and it's a sphere. These are fundamental. And so we develop these systems to be able to have the capability to connect the position of shapes and to be able to measure their distance and the relative size. Now, another thing that I've learned recently, which I did not know, our brain, why do you think when we walk and when I see a stair, then my foot goes in the right place? Why can the brain do that? Because the brain has developed a small replica of our skeleton and has one point of reference for that. And so when the babies, you have seen babies that do these crazy movements, that's how the brain learns. The brain, in fact, takes about people who do now this kind of training in robotic structures on how to walk and so forth. It takes about 100,000 times um, an effort, 100,000 times you have to try to move into the right place and to be in the right, uh, with, to have the right gait for, for a system to learn. The brain is trying these different motions and it takes you know, months for a human to walk. Not that the brain is not developed, it is developed, but it is the training that takes place. So because we have a skeleton, the human brain has a small replica of this skeleton. How does it develop it over time, obviously? So I don't know, I have a granddaughter who is like two years old and I was asking, <laughs> there is a song that, have, that asks you to touch your nose and ears. When she was young, instead of touching here, she was touching there. But she found easily, the ears were going somewhere here. And that is exactly how the brain then doing all of these practices. I mean, of course they do it playing and all of this is all learning. Then eventually when you touch your ears, you know where to go. You, 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 want, you know what to, do, what to do without looking at it because the muscles have been trained. They know where to stop, all right, where to have this. What is a species that does not have that capability? Do you know? And what is the, the, the result of not having one coordinate point? The octopus. The octopus does not have skeleton. The brain cannot create a replica of eight legs that are totally soft. So what is happening? Every leg controls its own movement. There is no central control because there is no capability of controlling a totally soft um, animal with eight legs 
and control the, the, the position of each one of those without having a skeleton. The brain could not, nature could not create that replica, no matter how many times, all right? It's like an impossible problem. To... So the, um, the octopus has a distributed brain, which means that there is the brain of every leg is distributed on its skin. Let me just move that so I can see better because there is a reflection. And every leg controls itself. And every leg has neurons. And there is a lot of processing in these neurons. And so when they do exploratory learning, every leg does its own thing. The brain, which is behind the eye, knows nothing about it. And only where there is a, a, a fall or something, I mean, that, that the, the octopus has to leave, is when this information goes to the central brain. And then all of the legs then are coordinated, but still they do their own thing. Because they, there is not one coordinate system that can describe the position and the movement. All right, so interesting on how the implication of those kinds of things. For us, even if we live in three dimensional in a three dimensional space, we simplify things and we solve things in a much more simplified way. So in engineering specifically, we do what we call deconstruction. So we have an idea of something big. We don't design it in that form out there, whatever we think of it. But we deconstruct a big problem into very small components that are easy to do individually. We are developing then what we call design policies from each one of those smaller problems. And then we use that to reconstruct the whole system and then design it. So a lot of times, even if the systems are in a 3D space plus time, you will see that we may have to go down to something as simple as one dimensional. Or we go down to like a 2D. And why do we have two different coordinate systems in two dimensions? We have the rectangular and we have the polar. Because some shapes are easier, as you will see in an example that I have, to do in polar form like this one here on the left. And other shapes like a, a circle, it's easier to describe in polar. And other shapes like a square, it's easier to describe in, a, in the XY system. Then we go to three dimensions. In three dimensions, we have three separate coordinate systems. And again, separate because of the three types of um, shapes that we have. And one group, it's easier to describe in XYZ. The other group that look more like cylinders are easier to describe in the cylindrical and then the spherical. Everything that looks like a sphere or has part, part there are parts of a sphere that make this shape. Now, here I want to attract your attention to the following. Every discipline uh, has the same X, Y, Z um, description of the Cartesian system, or the rectangular, if you like, all right, system. But when it comes to cylindrical and spherical, there are deviations. So for us in this class, in the cylindrical system, the rho represents the radius of the cylinder. And if you wanna talk about the, the, the uh, unit direct um, vector, it's gonna be for us like rho, you can see it like this, or you can see it like that. All right, the book has alpha sub rho. A lot of times to avoid all of this writing, this is the simpler. 
but they are unit vectors. And then for phi, you will see a unit vector either like this, or you're gonna see something like that. All right, and the same thing, Z is like we know it. Okay, now we go to the spherical. Also, pay attention, we have R for the radius. So you see unit vector R or A sub bar. Okay, then we have phi as we had in the um, cylindrical. So you have either phi or a sub phi. And then what do we have? Theta instead of z, obviously. So you have either theta or alpha sub theta. Now the difference, pay attention, when especially you look at for formulas somewhere out there, books, I mean, books notes, and so forth. Anything that comes from mathematics, it will have the phi instead of theta and theta instead of phi. And that is the most difficult. When I see students, because I will allow you to look for formulas, all right, whatever. I mean, everything we do is going to be open everything. But what is going to be then important for you is to know what you are doing, all right? Don't just copy a formula from the web, from another book, from notes without paying attention of what the definitions are. Because in this particular case, you're gonna make a big mistake. So that's I'm gonna to bring to your attention. Okay, so any questions about this before we move forward? To give you an example of how we do deconstruction of a problem and why we need different systems to be able to solve the same problem. Okay. Any questions though, so far? Pay attention to this problem because the um, exercise I'm going, I have already started for you, I have assigned, depends on that. It's the, you have to, and then you are gonna have until Friday to do it. Um, but if you go through this problem and understand what we're doing, it's gonna be very easy, okay. Now, what I have for you here are three complex problems for in circuit design. This is a PCB, a printed circuit board. How many of you do not know what is a printed circuit board? Everybody knows? Okay, you put chips on them, different components, all right? What happens at the back of a printed circuit board? All of these lines, what do these lines do? They bring signals to your chips, to your components, digital signals and RF signals. What is it interesting here? Look at that. There are lines like this one. There are lines like here. There are lines like here. and um, many other places, all right? These two, and look at here. All right, three places. What is interesting here? That the lines do not have the same distance. Do you see that? Now, of course, because we uh, uh, space, if you try to make a PCB, it's expensive. It goes by the area. And especially if you are to use one of these CMOS technologies, they don't use PCBs on that, but it goes by the area. How big is your wafer that they will make? And so ideally, if I was looking only at that, I would like to put the lines as close as possible. All right? If I did not have any other concerns, that's what I would do. If somebody would tell me, well, do something, but I want you to put in the least space you can make it, I mean, the whole thing will be will collapse to something much smaller. But we don't do that. Why is that? And why is it that we bring them here, but here we have so much space in between? Because those lines, there are other lines that bring DC. There are other lines that bring high frequencies. And what happens when lines carry currents? They communicate and we will see why they communicate. They, they, one, the field from one will impact 
the field on the other. And this is called coupling. So if you put the lines too close for the signals they bring, then you're gonna have noise. And this noise is gonna be horrible. It's not gonna, it's gonna destroy your circuit. So what do uh, designers do? They take something like that and they are looking at the, they deconstruct, as I said, the problem. They say, okay, what are the things that I have to pay attention to? The distance between lines, distance between digital lines, distance between high frequency lines. What other things do I need to pay attention to? For example, corners, you don't see anything to be like rectangular, right? They're all soft and everything. Why is that? Because if you send a current through a corner, it's gonna radiate if it is high frequency. So all, everything is soft. You don't want your current to see very high discontinuities and things like that. So, but let's look at the lines that are closed. Let's assume that I design for you and you come to me and say, you know what? I want you to develop a design policy for the distance between the lines. So we can put that in the computer that there's the layout. And then, so the computer will know that they should not bring these lines closer than something, okay? So how would I do that here? I bring you also some other examples. You see here, that's another printed circuit board, but this is at a much higher frequency. At a higher frequency, lines radiate too. We'll see that later. So this is low frequency and DC. Look at how um, far apart the lines are here. And then this is even higher frequency. That's a receiver for 5G. Look at the dimensions, five mi 500 microns. But there are places where the lines, these lines are very close because these lines make one line. Two conductors very close together make one transmission line. So they have them very close for a purpose. And then these are further apart that you see here because they don't work together. They have to be separate. And then what are these round things? Can you identify what is that? These are inductors and we'll see those inductors in this class. All right, so it is very important to develop the guidelines before you develop a circuit. Okay, so for us now, the problem is the following. So one of these many issues that I have to address is the distance between two lines. In the lines can have two possibilities. In a line, as I have them here, they can send different currents or the two lines, let me show you here, the two lines, can carry the same current, one here and the other line here. Well, let me go here. The other line here. And they both have the same current. Okay, whatever I do for the lines that have opposite currents, it's gonna be the opposite that is gonna happen when they carry the currents along the same direction and you will see why. But I took one of those. I assume that the two lines carry currents of the opposite direction. And you will see that if you want the two lines to work together as one, so it's one transmission line and in this particular case, it's called a strip line, a coupled strip line, all right, the name, then the currents have to be opposite. But if the lines are not supposed to work together, the currents have to be in the same direction and the lines have to be further away. So working together, opposite currents closer, working individually, the same direction further apart. All right, I chose this case. How am I gonna deconstruct this problem and simplify it? A, a strip line looks like this, it's on a dielectric. And let's assume that the dielectric has a thickness and has an effective dielectric, a relative dielectric constant of four. Now, uh, look at how many, how I simplify. And people developed circuits like that without having calculators even. 
all right? Exactly, so at least they did an analysis without having computers. And it was, they did, were able to do that because of that kind of thinking. And I have also to tell you, if you're gonna be a good designer in electronics, you have to understand the fundamental. Because if somebody wants you to build like the first circuit, there is no way you're gonna go and find a computer and throw the whole circuit in there and you expect the computer to tell you something. First of all, it's gonna run for days and most of the time the results are not necessarily reliable. So designers know the fundamentals. I don't know whether I told you in this class or in the other section, it's like in the arts. You cannot become a good artist and paint well if you don't know the fundamental colors and how to mix them. If you don't know how the light comes on a body or on a shape and how the shadows are created. If you don't know these kinds of fundamental things, then without those, you cannot do anything. All right, you're gonna do weird stuff. <laughs> People buy weird stuff, but I'm telling you, you're not gonna be a good artist. Usually good artists learn a lot of things. They learn geometry. They know how to do projections, all right? They know how to create shadows for lighting. They know how to mix colors. So this is not very different from electronics. You need to know the fundamentals. You need to know how the fields, because that's what happened in electronic circuits and in antennas. You have a field everywhere. You need to know how this field behaves. You have multiple fields everywhere. You need to know what is gonna happen fundamentally when these fields are there. So for example, I know after so many years that if I put two wires together, one has the opposite direction from the other, it's not gonna work well if I want them to be independent. All right, so that is an example of something very fundamental. How do we even get there now that we are learning, all right? In this class, we learn the fundamentals. So first, um, first assumption. I said, okay, if this is a, a strip that carries one current, and this is another one that carries the opposite, I know that what happens when you have a wire and then carries a current? What have you learned from physics? That a current carrying wire creates what kind of a field? A magnetic field, we know that. Okay, now if it creates a magnetic field and this magnetic field goes around the wire, all right, we'll see that, then you expect the field lines to be inside the dielectric and outside. So I say, okay, I'm gonna find an equivalent space, which is gonna be uniform because that's gonna simplify. I will not have to worry about having a layer of dielectric. So an equivalent space that has a new dielectric constant, which is the arithmetic average between free space and the material. So I find a new relative dielectric constant, which is about 2.5. And I'm telling you, it's not gonna go very far away from reality in what I'm looking for. All right, so now, I have these two currents. In this particular case, there are two ways, in fact, I would like to correct this because I don't want you to get confused. So um, in, in this case, let me see. It's coming out of the board and the other one goes in the board. And it is in that space, uniform space, all right? And that's infinite. And why can I go infinite? Because in reality, the further away I go from the current, the lower the field. And so I don't wanna go very far away. No, it's not gonna be a very important, okay. Now, look at this. This is a top view. This is a 3D view. So now I did one more thing. I went from every strip to a wire. I said, okay, I will assume that instead of having a strip that carries a current, I have a wire, that all of the current is 
um, concentrated on this thin wire. But to be able to do that, I had to modify a little bit the distance. Because in reality, if I go, and that's something you eventually you learn later, in reality, if you have a strip like this, all right, and it's a strip, you know how the current goes? The current goes like this. But when you, in, even if it goes like that because of edge effects here, when you integrate, you find that a value i, these edge effects are not very important if you are, unless you are so close to one another. So I don't care about this. I simplify it and I assume that the current flows uniformly. All right, so that's still a, another assumption that I did, I took. And after I assumed it was uniformly, then I assumed even one step further that it was a simple wire and just had a current I that was the integral of the initial one, whatever value. In fact, even that integral had a value. Is, uh, finding the distance between two, these two is not even important to know the value to tell you the truth. You will see why. But these are kind of the kinds of assumptions I make. Okay. So now we have these two wires. Now we go into something that we can recognize. You can recognize, all right? Now it's something that is not that foreign from what we started with something really advanced and we are going to the fundamentals, all right? So now we have, let's start with this one. What always, remember, your right hand, the right hand rule. The current goes up, therefore the magnetic field goes like in these purple lines for the first, for the wire to the left. For the wire to the right, because the current goes in the opposite direction, the magnetic field lines go the opposite. You see here, what is happening when the lines go like that? Very interesting. When the currents are opposing, then the lines in between the wires align and they are along the same direction. So the magnetic fields are um, added there. So the magnetic field in the region in between becomes very strong if they're opposite. All right, and then what happens outside of the two wires? They become, um, they go in the different direction, which means that they are subtracted. So the field becomes very weak. So what is then your conclusion if the current, if the two wires had the same current? then the field in between will be subtracted, the fields will subtract and will add away from the wires, all right? The opposite. So this is important to know. You will never put wires that will have opposing currents one next to the other, because they will have very strong influence on each other. That is very important. Then we go down here and shows how the fields lie align here and how they misalign there in terms of the direction. And therefore, when the two wires here carry opposite current, then the field is the strongest in between them and it's very weak away. So you don't, if you want the two wires to work together, that's perfect. That's how you have to make them work and that's gonna be a transmission line by itself. Then if they become so coupled, then they operate as one, all right? If this coupling is very strong. If I don't want them to operate as one, then I will make sure that the current, if it's DC, is gonna be in the same direction and I will move them a little further away. So to make sure that in between the current is weak enough so that it does not influence each other. But now having said that physically, let's do what, how we would compute that mathematically. 
okay? We know, and we will see it again, but if you take one, of a, or one wire that carries one current, I, then we know that the magnetic field that is introduced by this is given in this form. Do you agree? Do you remember that from physics? We'll see this again, don't worry. It's not something, that's why I give it to you because we will see it again and we will derive it even. So if you don't remember the formula, you can find it. Okay, also what is interesting? I used a cylindrical system to study this problem. For me to find this, real, this formula for B, I had to use a cylindrical coordinate system because it's easy. So I want to go easy all the time, all right? I go, always I go and find the easiest way to get to my result. As long as I have only one wire, that's not a problem. So I can do it like this. What happens, however, when I have two wires and each one of them can give me this, but on its own coordinate system, all right? So after I write the formulas for each of the wires on their own coordinate system, then I will have to bring them to one common coordinate system. Because otherwise, if you have the expressions for B for each wire on its own coordinate system, you cannot sum them up. You can never sum vectors who have been expressed in different coordinate systems. Because you're gonna make a huge mistake and it's gonna be all garbage. <laughs> I have to remember that. Never, never sum or do anything. Vectors that have been expressed in different coordinate systems. You have to bring them to one coordinate system. And which coordinate system did I select? The X, Y, Z. Why did I select the X, Y, Z and I did not select a third? Um, a third uh, cylindrical system. Because it's easier to describe two wires like this. In a Cartesian system, in a rectangular system, not in a cylindrical. Because if I put them like this, then the position of one is at minus y somewhere. The position of this, because you remember, I'm looking, look at what I have done in this particular, they go, the two wires, and you could do it differently, but that's what I selected. The two wires, in fact, go like this, if I were to put them in three dimensions. I did not do all of this because it would get too confusing, all right? So I assume I'd selected a coordinate system where X is the direction of the wires, the two wires are placed along the y direction, one at the negative y, the other at a positive y, all right? And they are not on the z direction. So as a matter of fact, if I wanted to show where is one of these wires, I just can give it with a value of the y component only, all right? That's why I did, I selected the, that coordinate system. I went always, you always select the easiest coordinate system for your design. Okay. Now, in this coordinate system, I have now to translate the B field. Okay. And I have to translate them at the place where I'm interested mostly to find what the value is. And as you know, I'm mostly interested in the value of the field in between the two wires, because that's where the value is the strongest. And I know I need to know how strong it is there. So from all the other places where I can calculate B1 and B2, I select the center of the coordinate system because I have placed the two wires symmetrically. I select the center of the coordinate system and on the basis of my coordinate system, 
the magnetic field is going to be at that point along the z direction. Do you see why? Why is it going to go on along the z direction at that point? Because I will do it here. I will try to put the two, only the cross, sec the cross sections of the wires, all right? So here, one is here and the other is there. This carries I, this carries minus I, I minus I. How do the fields go from previously? For this one, they, the purple lines go like that. So this one is coming out. Let me see. And this one goes in. Okay. So the lines go like this here. And the line in the other one goes like this. At the center. So how do they are, how are they exactly at this point? They are going like this, one here like that, and the other here, purple, like this. And what is this direction for the system I selected? Which direction is that? The Z direction. Okay, so all of this leads me into this simple formula. I took from the cylindrical coordinates, each of the, of the wires had its own cylindrical coordinates. I took this simplistic formula that I got before, which was mu i over two pi rho. And then I found what rho was in each case, d minus over two, d minus over two, and then I have already, I found, I use the same i, why is that? Why did I not put i in one and minus i in the other? Because I have already taken into account the direction of the current in the direction of the field. All right, see, these two here, I decided that they align because the currents are different. So I have already taken care of the direction. So the two fields will look like this. They are identical at the center and they sum up to give something which is twice as large as the magnetic field of one wire at that point. So, I did the simplest thing, all right? So the question is what happens at another point? We're gonna see that when we get there, not today. But I did this problem for you to give you an idea starting with a practical problem. Because this one, if, I, if you do it for wires that go like this, the currents, you will find where the field is the strongest. And if you want to enhance this field because you want to use them together, then you have to bring them as close as possible to make it strong. But if you want to separate the wires, all right, ideally at the center, like at Z, it's going to be zero if they, the currents are in the same direction, but you're going to have a lot of field that is between that zero and the wire itself. So you will have to space them far enough, all right? So you don't have to match in that area in between the two wires. So you like to minimize that. So in one case, you enhance it when you use them together as a transmission line. In the other case, you reduce it, the field, I mean, when you wanna use them separately. And this, if you think that way, you create rules for circuit layouts. And that's how the advanced um, simulation tools and layout tools, they use these design rules. Or before when people were doing them by hand, we'll use the same design rules, all right? And that's an example of why we have 
to select the best coordinate system for the individual wire when we find the field, and then how we have to go from each of these cylindrical, separately though, design, uh, identified systems, the two cylindrical systems. You could not sum up the field picture because I have seen that many times when early in our studies, some students will try to sum up ex uh, fields that have been expressed in different coordinate systems. No. You have to bring them to the same coordinate system and then you superimpose them. Okay? Any questions in relation to that? So, since we covered this, and I will upload that right after this class um, with all of the notes that I have in there, I will upload it on your uh, canvas as soon as I go back that you're gonna see the following. So now I'm gonna stop this broadcasting and I'm gonna go here. Okay, now we are gonna go to Top Hat. Okay, and in Top Hat, if you go to exercises, you're not gonna see everything, but you're gonna see Did I say exercise one? It's supposed to be exercise two. I will fix that, don't worry. So it's the second exercise. We don't lose anything. It's just uh, my <laughs> mistake in the, in the title. So in this one, I, I, exactly the same problem. I say consider a vector B that is given by that in the cylindrical coordinate system, rho phi and z. What are the components of this vector on the x equals zero plane of the Cartesian coordinate system that has the same origin and the same z axis with the cylindrical system? So I tell you how, so it's just a conversion from one system to another. But I don't want you to do it, I just want you to identify which of these solutions is the correct one. That should be easy if you go and review, all right, what we did today. But I want that so you can get a, like a little bit of comfort in the, or like you feel, you feel comfortable um, transitioning from one coordinate system to another. We're not gonna do crazy transitions. I can tell you the most difficult you're gonna probably see will be from cylindrical to Cartesian. And um, that's about it uh, for, for tran um, transformations of uh, coordinate systems. We are gonna use the spherical coordinate system only at one place when we talk about shielding, all right? Or fields, how do we do shielding? It's gonna be in electrostatics. But that's what you would have to do and has already been assigned and you will have to do it, uh, you will have until Wednesday, uh, Friday, excuse me. And uh, you don't have any particular time. I mean, this is, you can do it. You have enough time. I mean, I give you enough time to do that. Okay. Any questions? On anything? Go ahead. Speak up. Yes. Here, if you go back. here, here rather, okay. You go back here, um, look at that. I usually uh, put, if we don't cover all of the sections of a chapter, I will only put the sections we cover. If we cover all the chapter, then I will have the whole chapter. So it's chapter two of the book, okay. Any other questions? Everything that you need is here. You need to get comfortable to go and find. So I try to put everything, every connection is on your homepage. And the other thing I, for, I may have forgotten to tell you, um, when I send announcements, you need to, because I know you may not necessarily check your emails all the time, make sure that when uh, you go to Canvas and you do the settings, 
you ask to get a warning every time there is an announcement. So you know that uh, something came that you need to look at. All right, so a warning means like a sound or something. So to have, to have an indication that you received something. So you have to do it yourself. You have to set it up for yourself. Okay, I think this is what we are gonna have for today. And um, we'll start with vector calculus, which is really fun because now we are gonna, all of this, if you know why we do things, you know, people get very bored about math alone. And I don't blame anybody that gets bored with math if you don't know why we use math. Why is it important? And I think math, as I said, is a language. We use it to communicate things and to be able to solve things. So that's why I will try to uh, also show you application, all of the applications of math, all of the, whatever we will study that is mathematical is gonna be done on a particular application. Okay, so you see why it is important. Okay, so we are good for today and I will see you on Friday. And we have office hours from 4.30 to 6.30. I know that some of you have a problem with homework, question two. The only hint I will give you, remember from geometry, the formula that gives you the diagonal or the diagonals in a parallelogram. You will find it everywhere. Go on the web and it's gonna come out <laughs> immediately. So that is gonna be the key that you need to remember for that problem. But uh, if you have any questions, join me in the uh, office hours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.